I'm Ruth Hayes. I'm teaching in a program called Visualizing Microbial Seascapes, which is part of this cohort of people here. And I'm really happy to introduce my colleague, Gerardo Chinleo, who is an oceanographer and a marine microbiologist. And he's going to talk today about ocean systems and uh, climate change. Okay, thanks, Ruth. So, um, thanks for having me over to give this lecture. As Ruth said, I'm. Uh, ooh, let me see. If it didn't come out. Start my presentation. There you go. Okay. So, as Ruth mentioned, I'm a marine scientist, and I hope to um, show you today that the oceans have a huge importance in terms of global climate change. In fact, that's why I became interested, even though my area expertise is really microbiology. Um, my microbes have a huge impact globally and um, in, especially in terms of global climate change. I hope, show, hope to give you some information about that. I'm the third one in this series, um, so I hope you had a chance to kind of reflect on what's been covered so far. So I thought I'd start just by making some connections that I made myself, just uh, reflecting on what's been said and read. So I put here an, um, at the top the label, the Anthropocene, with an exclamation mark and a question mark, and that's basically to highlight the complexity of the term, right? So we, you've been uh, hearing about what it implies about how we uh, view the environment and how we view humans role in the environment. And you'll see more debate over the, what that term um, implies and reflects about the debate. So things that should be familiar to you that we covered, one is that uh, there's evidence that the, the humans have made huge impacts on the earth on the scale of what we see over geologic time um, and space, over huge planetary scales. And we also learned that humans are fairly recent um, in this Earth's history. So custom problems in their ability to conceptualize problems that are so large in terms of their impact and duration. Uh, we also learned that uh, there's a lot of disagreement in our on, in a, a civilization, and that poses problems in terms of how we conceptualize what is a problem and how we uh, agree on what is a, a solution. And uh, the obvious thing is that the complexity of the problem implies that you really need an interdisciplinary approach to understanding it. So this is a kind of valuable forum where the several of us kind of contributing to an understanding of this big phenomena. Okay. So a little bit of a review of what I hope to cover today. Basically three major uh, categories. One, a little crash course in oceanography. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what is climate um, and how do we know it's changed? Are we dealing with global climate change? And I'll introduce the role of the oceans in, in that understanding. And as, uh, as you'll see, I'll talk about the two major things that we're concerned when we're looking at the human influence on climate, which is CO2 concentrations and temperature. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the kind of technical evidence supporting this contention that humans have a huge influence on climate. It's something that gets lost, it's something that is very technical, so it's many times not accessible to the general public, so I'm gonna to try to kind of give you some insights in some of the more technical parts of the evidence as an example, the, the, the lines of reasoning that scientists use to um, uh, make assessments about humans' influence on, the, on climate. And finally, I'll talk about uh, specifically some of the things that we understand as being effects now and predict into the future of global climate change on the oceans. So we're gonna deal with the oceans so um, I'd like to, I think I did this uh, a little bit of uh, audience participation. So I'd like you to think about these two questions just for about a minute. You can uh, maybe uh, think about it for a minute, maybe talk to your neighbors and think of what the answers would be. Um, and we don't need to, uh, I, I know uh, it's kind of complicated for the experimental theater to um, give an answer, but for this short question, so I'll just have you think about it. Maybe I'll ask some of those people in this, um, in the recital hall, and then I'll communicate that to the experimental theater. Okay, so think about the, but what are the, your answers to this. Uh, what percentage of the surface area of the, of the Earth is covered by water? And the next question is, when you consider the whole volume of that living space, called the biosphere, what percentage is accounted by the, by the marine environment? So just one quick minute. Think about it, and then you can maybe talk to your neighbors and come up with a consensus. <laughs> 
Okay, why don't we get some answers from here at the recital hall. Uh, how about the first one? W what are some uh, estimates of the answer of the surface area? Can you see it louder? 79%. Somebody said 79%. Can I have a, another bidder? 71%, okay, so um, the answer is close to that second, second estimate, 70%. A lesser known fact, and I know this because I, I teach oceanographies, also about 70% of the oceanography textbooks begin by stating that fact. Okay, how about the second one? Some, some uh, estimates of the, on the second number, the volume. How about a couple ones? Somebody said 90, how about one more? 96. 99.5, okay. <laughs> so you guys are close, but not quite close, right? So why such a large number? Well, you need to consider that um, life can exist in the deep sea, even though there might be lower concentrations, but essentially what we consider the biosphere is basically marine. So hopefully this, um, this kind of factoid is gonna uh, stress the importance of ocean life and ocean processes in a variety of planetary issues. Okay, so let's talk about, um, uh, about climate, okay? So I, start, I wanna start with this image because you've seen it a lot and it kind of encapsulates the argument that humans are involved in influencing climate at a lot of different scales. So you know, we see um, here is the variations of temperature and then the red is basically the killing curve showing the increase in CO2, right? So we're talking about this as evidence for the, that the humans are causing climate change. So I think it's important first to understand what climate is and then how, do we, how can we establish what, when change is occurring, okay? So let's start with the definition of climate and, weather, and uh, how this is distinguishable from weather. So I, uh, here I have in bold uh, some of the important terms so you don't need to, if you're writing all this stuff, you can just maybe focus on the, what I highlighted. So climate is, can be defined as the condition of the atmosphere. Meteorology is the study of the atmosphere as measured by di different parameters. And I highlighted temperature because that's the one we typically measure. And it makes sense because in a sense it's the easiest, easiest one to measure and it also affects the other variables that are described here. So temperature affects moisture, precipitation, wind velocity, all that stuff is affected by temperature. So if you wanna just measure a single thing that um, is a representative of the state of the atmosphere, you know, temperature is a pretty good one to follow. The important part here in this definition is that climate is really, a statistically based concept. It's an average. It's an average over space and time. So it's important to underscore that because when you hear debates about weather and climate, or climate change, sometimes people confuse climate with weather. So weather is the exact same measurement, but at a, at a certain just point in space and time. The weather can be variable. It's a single measurement, a single observation, but it, it's part of what determines climate. So people always talk about extreme weather as being examples of global climate change, but a single example of uh, extreme weather does not indicate a change in climate. We need to consider the average, and as you know, when you calculate any average, there's bound to be some variation, okay? So it's important to, to understand that some people kind of summarize this into kind of brief phrases. Climate is kind of what you expect because you have this average expectation, what's gonna happen to weather in Germany, or the weather before the Industrial Revolution, things like that. And, uh, sorry, the climate, sorry. And weather is just instantaneous. What was the weather today? You know, what's the weather, uh, what was the weather yesterday? Okay. So how do you know it's changing? If, if, it's, a, if it's a complicated concept in, involving some variation and a mean, how do we know it's changed? So I chose this uh, illustration to try to show that. So what this illustrates is Two different climates, one has changed to the other, previous climate here and the new climate. Um, for a purpose, you can think about previous climate, maybe the climate pre-industrial revolution, a new climate after the industrial revolution. And what this curve show is a variation in weather observations. So this temperature in this axis, and this other axis is the probability of that particular temperature occurring. So for this previous climate, most of the temperature variations are within the, the body of the bell curve. And then we have extreme weather that represents things that are low probability, rare events, but they're part of the normal variation of that weather, of that climate system. 
So what happens when it changes? When it changes, we can conceive of a change when the weather we experience um, becomes normal, becomes more frequent than you would expect. So rare, what would you would consider a rare event in a previous climate now becomes normal. So you can think about extreme weather in this previous climate now fits in the main body of what we conceptualize as a new climate. So if that occurs frequently enough, we cannot support longer the assumption that we have this previous climate because the frequency of those other events are too often beyond what we'd expect if the old climate was present. And if we actually have a new climate, you also expect also the extremes to be more extremes that we would have predicted if the previous climate was present. To be able to do this analysis, uh, you need a lot of data, and you need data over time, right? So that ex ex uh, explains why, you know, science always says we need more information and our ability to um, gain certainty on certain conclusions depend on more data. And we have a lot of data. I'll show you some data from temperature that we have that's fairly current. This uh, shows you the pattern of temperature increases between 1880 and the present. And I'll explain how, how they're presented here. People usually talk about the trend and then don't tell you much about the units. And I wanna explain the units because in the discussion of the climate has changed, we also need to determine change relative to what, right? So humans, we have this, I guess, uh, uh, choice to determine what we consider normal or what we consider previous climate. And it's important to define it to be able to establish that, that, that now is different than before. So in order to look at temperatures and see temperature indeed changing from something, we need to define what that something is. Some examples of how that, it, that is done is people say, well, we're curious about how temperature is changing relative to the end of the 20th century or the end of the 19th century or the in pre-industrial conditions, right? So we define that. In meteorology, usually that's defined as the average of the data over a 30 year period. Why 30? I don't know exactly. I assume it's because over 30 years, you encapsulate seasonal variation and interannual variation. So it's a good estimator of what happened over a long period of time. The more current data, like the one I'm showing you here from NOAA, actually looks at changes relative to the last century, which is the 20th century. So what they did here is they calculated the average between 1901 and 2000 of temperature globally. It's got the average. And then every year between 1880 and the present, the yearly average they compared to that mean. So basically saying, how does this year's temperature compare to the average of the 20th century? So if you have a positive number, means that the temperature is higher than the average of the 20th century, indicating that it's different. If it's less, it's also different but cooler. If the number that you get is zero, you get the exact value for the average of the year to the average of the last century. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So fairly, I think recently they switched to that once we passed the, the 20th century, people stopped doing it relative to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And this way to show it just highlights how the newest, the most recent data shows a constant increase. So these are called anomalies. The, the, uh, the term is called anomaly. Anomaly means kind of out of the ordinary. So a difference from the ordinary, which is that average climate. And we can see that um, we're considering to calculate average this whole period of the 20th century. So if you look at all the data in the 21st century, they're all uh, very high. So the trend is something just increasing temperature over time. So more complexity that I'll explain in this graph is obviously you see these bars, people just show you the trend, but the bars indicate um, the range of variability and the reliability of that estimate. So it's important to do that to show how much confidence you have that, that this trend is real and not due to just random variation. Okay. okay, so we need to consider that when we study climate and its change. We need a lot of data and we need to consider variation. We also need to consider climate is really complicated. We're, we're looking just at CO2 and temperature, but it's really, really complicated. 
So this picture tried to just kind of summarize some of the complications. Um, first, it's not complicated because solar energy really drives climate. So solar radiation provides the energy that drives climate. Over long periods of time or geologic time, these variations in the solar radiation reaching the Earth do explain things like ice ages, long-term variations in climate. And I think Zita will talk about that in more detail um, next quarter. The complication is over short time scales, this energy that reaches the Earth is moved uh, among a whole bunch of different compartments on the Earth. So you can see here solar energy entering into this big circle, and this big circle has uh, components of the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, which is the oceans, the solid Earth, continents, and the biota, living things. So energy is transferred, moved around in all these compartments. The movement of this compartment is also very dynamic. It changes over time and space. And also the way compartments interact with each other is not linear. So one push in one direction doesn't result in the movement of the compartment that was pushed in the same direction. Sometimes it reacts in a way to counter the disturbance. So they have these things that may be familiar to you in terms of terms, negative and positive feedback loops. So again, in terms of understanding human's influence on the planet, we need to consider all this stuff. We need to consider, again, variation and the fact that there's multiple drivers of climate. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the oceans because the oceans are a major driver of climate. And I'm gonna talk about the two major ways in which it affects climate. One is how it controls heat in the planet. And the second one is how it controls CO2 in the atmosphere as part of the carbon cycle. So I highlighted the first one because I'll start with that. So first, a little bit of lesson in, uh, I guess, chemistry or physics. So water is really important in terms of climate regulation because it can store a lot of heat. There's complicated ways to explain it. This, this term heat capacity is how we measure the amount of heat that can be stored in a liquid. It's the amount of heat needed to raise any liquid one degree Celsius, one mil of the liquid one degree Celsius. And water, because it has this hydrogen bonding that keeps it, um, it's, it's, it's hard to separate those bonds. So it's really hard to change its temperature, temperature being the amount of kinetic energy in the system, the energy of motion. So the consequences I listed here below, because there's such a heat, high heat capacity, then heat is stored in large bodies of water. Big lakes and the oceans store a tremendous amount of heat. As water changes phases, and water is in the, available in three phases in the planet, solid, gas, and liquid, as it changes phases, such as releases of source temperature. So as water currents move back and forth, they affect regional um, temperatures and also affect seasonality. So how, why do we need to know about how this is distributed, how energy is distributed? Well, because the, dis the energy reaching the Earth kind of varies in its intensity. So this shows how the sun's rays um, hit the equator kind of more directly and at an angle here are the higher latitudes. So in terms of the density of the energy more is reaching the equator, so it's much warmer. So ocean circulation serves to kind of redistribute heat along the planet. There's two types of circulation, so she's a little bit more of oceanography. Um, one is simply the surface circulation that's driven by the winds. And that's important for short-term storage of heat in the order of years, days, uh, maybe hundreds of years, and transferring that to higher latitudes. There's also the deep sea circulation, and when I get to the explanation of that, I'll, I'll talk more about how it relates to climate, but they're four very important types of circulation. So let's kind of look at their patterns. Okay, so this, will, this um, map of the planet shows you kind of general pattern of circulation. So I'd like to, you to note these big arrows, um, you can see, sorry, these big arrows, I'm hoping you can see it with uh, my cursor here, uh, indicate the, the, the trajectory of the circulation. So in the Northern Hemisphere, the circulation is clockwise, Southern Hemisphere is counterclockwise. These arrows are color, color coded, so the, uh, the red colors indicate hot currents. So the two currents I'd like you to notice are the Gulf Stream here in the eastern coast of the US and the Kuroshio Current here on the eastern coast of um, Japan. They're major currents and you can see how they transfer heat from the equator up to higher latitudes. 
I'm gonna show you, um, I have a couple animations, hopefully they'll work. Um, I'm not gonna show them the entire animation, so I'll, I'll kind of narrate a little bit and stop it. So I'll kind of tell you now what I want you to look for. There's a lot of stuff in each animation. So the first one I want to show you is from uh, NASA, it's called Ocean Circulation, it covers a couple of years. And uh, what I would like you to notice is the, the, um, the strength, you can see it by the thickness of the circulation lines that are used to represent it, of the Kuroshio and the Gulf Stream. And I'd also like to, uh, uh, appreciate how complicated circulation is. This diagram just shows you the major currents, and you'll see there's a lot of fine scale details, and there's also seasonal variations, and there's also a lot of eddies. Eddies are these little circulation cells that break off major currents. They're pretty, pretty distinctive when you see the, the animation. The second animation I'm gonna show you is from the NOAA, the Oceanographic Administration, and that shows you how, what's the outcome of those currents. So you'll see how temperature is moved to different latitudes. And it's a pretty neat, neat animation, it covers 20, 25 years, I think, or, or, 20, yeah, or a little more of data. So it also shows you the, the, uh, move, the changes in the ice caps over time. And also you should note how, it so demonstrates that the different hemispheres, the seasons are reversed. So it's a kind of pretty striking one. Okay, so I'm gonna try to show you that at this point. Okay, so this one is uh, it's called the Perpetual Ocean. So it shows you um, the currents as these lines that are animated. And here we have the Gulf Stream going up to high latitudes. And you see some of the gyres, some of the sort of eddies are formed uh, and uh, come out of the main circulation. So it's kind of soothing. I don't want to show it too much, but then you fall asleep. <laughs> so I did. But it's, uh, it's kind of soothing. There's some music to it. If you, you, you do tell there's a bunch of different versions from Mozart to like uh, Talking Heads, you know, whatever you want to <laughs> associate with this. I'll, I'll stop in a little bit. But again, note no, the, all the eddies. But if you um, visualize the previous diagram, you see the main currents are there. Uh, if you look closely at each of the eddies, sometimes you'll see variations as reflected by, um, uh, as evidence of uh, seasonal variations in circulation. Pardon my lecture, I'll, this, I'll explain El Nino. The El Nino phenomenon occurs in the Equatorial Pacific, and I think we probably passed the Equatorial Pacific already. So it's kind of circulating. Okay, I'm gonna stop it now, and then I'm gonna talk about the, um, the other image. And this covers a lot of years. So note again, um, the red indicates a warmer weather. And uh, it's very striking to see the ice caps growing and, um, and, and, and uh, retracting. I didn't have time to look at it carefully to see over this period, you see more of the um, zone around the Arctic being ice free. But again, what I want to highlight in terms of this presentation is if you look at here, uh, the Gulf Stream how the heat is transferred up to higher latitudes, and again, the Kuroshio current uh, off of the coast of Japan. I'm gonna stop it. Go back to PowerPoint. Okay, so um, I was afraid it wasn't gonna work, so I had this uh, kind of my backup but just to show you this one. So this is an uh, illustration of just the Gulf Stream. So it shows you that the, the um, surface temperature is warm by the sun here at the Caribbean, and then the Gulf Stream transport the heat up to higher latitudes. And that explains why, for example, in England, you can grow roses and the temperature at the same latitude in England when you go further into Europe is much colder. So this is a very important uh, system that helps uh, keep um, the water warm um, in the Northern Hemisphere, and so it affects the climate in Europe. And this circulation also is connected to the next circulation we're gonna talk about, the thermohaline deep ocean circulation. So let's go to the next slide, that shows that. So if you looked at the Gulf Stream, it was out, out here, and uh, the circulation leads to waters going to the North Atlantic. And the North Atlantic and also part of Antarctica, there's zones where 
the conditions are unique, so the water gets really cold and really salty, so it actually sinks. And the sinking of that water drives water below it, producing horizontal circulation along the oceans. That's called a thermohalan circulation. Thermal means temperature, halo means salt. So it's driven by changes in temperature and salt. And that's also really important because it helps drive some of the surface circulation and it represents this long storage of heat in the oceans. An interesting thing um, that uh, you often relate to this in terms of climate regulation is that when the ice caps melt, you get a lot of fresh water entering the North Atlantic and that interferes with that sinking of the water. And the sinking of the water is part of the reason there's more heat being released in the inter higher latitudes. So basically global warming could potentially lead to what they call local cooling. And over geologic time, there's evidence of major uh, disturbances in climate in our hemisphere due to changes in ocean circulation, particularly associated with thermohaline circulation. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the oceans in terms of heat distribution. Let's talk about it, them in terms now of the role on, in terms of CO2. Okay, so, so why worry about CO2? So we've kind of been reading a lot about it. Humans produce it through fossil fuel burning. So a way to determine if CO2 is an important driver in climate is look at what we call paleo archives. Paleo means over geologic time, archives means data information. And I've here show, uh, I think that showed this graph. This is the Bostock core. The Bostock core was obtained in Antarctica to look at ancient uh, climates by looking at the gases in, uh, trapped in the bubbles in ice. And uh, this is just one, you've probably seen in different versions. The scale has uh, time, the presence here is on the left. And um, it follows, it tracks the concentration of uh, greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane and temperature. So what you see is that they, there's a, a relationship they kind of co-vary. As one goes up, the other, the other one goes up. As temperature goes up, CO2 goes up. As they go down, they kind of co-vary. So this has given us evidence that climate can be driven by these greenhouse gases, considering all the other stuff that could drive it. So we use it as evidence for the mechanism that now increases CO2 are involved in climate change. So let's look more carefully at the carbon cycle then, because the carbon cycle dictates how much CO2 is going to be in the atmosphere. And as you see, the oceans have an important role to play. So this little illustration shows a carbon cycle. Um, there's a bunch of different compartments for it, and carbon flows from one to the other. So let me talk about some of them. The atmosphere is probably the smallest one, but it's the most dynamic one. It changes the most rapidly. Things can come in and out of it very rapidly. And we're particularly concerned with it because the type of carbon that's in the atmosphere, CO2, is a greenhouse gas. So even though it's low concentration, has, is a major has a major effect on climate. The oceans are obviously important. There's a huge reservoir of carbon, both living and non-living carbon. Also land and continental rocks include like fossil fuels and other things that are, have been buried that are part of the carbon cycle. Let's look at the dynamics of the carbon cycle. When you look at the dynamics, the carbon cycle has really two components. One that cycles really slowly, slowly, or geologic time, and then one cycles really, fa really fast. So the slow cycle, 10,000 millions of years for an element of carbon to be cycled through all those compartments. And that's um, carbon that's moved through, through volcanism, ejects carbon to the atmosphere, that rains out, you know, weathers the rocks. Um, there's all these transformations that are very slow. Eventually some of that carbon gets buried in marine sediments and they resurface again through volcanism, plate tectonics. That takes a long time, millions of years to we completed that cycle. Part of the cycle for our, our, our interest for this discussion is fossil fuel, fossil fuel carbon. So fossil fuels are you know, ultimately derived from plant material. If it gets buried, it doesn't get decomposed. Over millions and millions of years, that becomes fossil fuels. The fast cycle is essentially photosynthesis and respiration. It's, it's primarily driven by biological processes. And I put here in bold how they're connected in terms of our interest in fossil fuels. So over the short term cycle, a little bit of organic matter escapes decomposition during the year. So there's a cycle of growth, decomposition, growth, decomposition, and a tiny amount escapes decomposition. And over millions and millions of years, it accumulates, becomes fossil fuels, enters this long term cycle. So what humans have done um, is you can consider this short circuiting these two cycles. Carbon that would have taken millions and millions of years to cycle from zero to 60 in your Porsche Turbo Carrera. Doesn't the atmosphere? Okay. 
So carbon, the, short, the short short is as follows. Okay, so fossil fuels um, take millions of years to cycle, but humans have burned them and in, immediately put them in the atmosphere where they have an impact on climate. This is from the IPCC report. Um, I think I gave you that as an assignment, or at least a synthesis. So if you are more interested in the specific numbers, I know they're hard to read here, but I'll point out some important parts of this diagram. This diagram summarizes what we understand as a contemporary carbon cycle, carbon cycle today. So same things to note is the major compartments, the atmosphere, the oceans, land, down here in these boxes are uh, fossil fuel reserves and other materials. The things I'd like you to note, at least just visually as you follow this diagram, is uh, all the, the arrows and values in red. Those indicate human inputs of CO2 into different compartments, either extracting them or putting them into the atmosphere or going into the oceans since the Industrial Revolution. So some important uh, things to note is um, the atmospheric pool has increased tremendously by about 40%. So the human inputs of carbon dioxide have been huge. Uh, noting on that, you can look at the fossil fuel reserves here in this box below. The red is how much we've used so far. So there's still a whole bunch of carbon that we could still put in the atmosphere in terms of coal, gas, et cetera, et cetera. So this pool in the atmosphere can still grow quite a bit. The other thing to note is that there's these important arrows that go into the ocean. So the ocean actually has a huge role in buffering, in reducing the amount of CO2 that's put into the atmosphere by human activities. Okay, so let's look back in that more detail. So we look at the fate of, of that anthropogenic carbon emitted to the atmosphere. Here's a, uh, the amount, so it's very striking. Five, five, oh, that's a lot of fives. I didn't realize it's all fives. Easy to remember. Uh, picograms, people don't know what a picogram is here. I put in down, down here. It's 10 to the 15th, it's a really big number, picogram. So a huge amount has been released in the atmosphere and this is where it's gone. Only about 43%, about 50% accumulates in the atmosphere. So not everything that's put up in the atmosphere stays in the atmosphere and, and that increases. Uh, some is absorbed by land. And for a long time, it was called the missing carbon. It was hard to figure out where it was going. Some uh, hypothesis was going to the growth of new forest after a logging. But we understand now it's more of a land sink. Uh, land plants maybe are, are fertilized by more CO2. Growth rates have increased because there's more CO2 which is needed for, for photosynthesis. For, in, for our in purposes, the important one is this one. A whole bunch is absorbed by the oceans. So the or, oceans are an important sink, kind of removes CO2, helps reduce the, um, the impact. Over geologic time, uh, chemists will argue that eventually the oceans will be able to absorb all the CO2, but uh, the problem is the rate. The rate's fairly slow. Humans are putting in CO2 faster than it's being removed. So uh, this leads to this next kind of uh, text here. We see that even though these numbers are fairly recent, um, the, the, a larger proportion of fossil fuel CO2 is, is becoming part of the atmosphere. Why? Because the sinks are being affected. Um, there's things that, that affect how much CO2 goes into the oceans, which I'll describe later on. So some effects of global warming may magnify, I mean, a positive feedback loop to increasing the rate at which CO2 gets accumulated in the atmosphere. But let's look at ocean processes. How do, do oceans deal with the CO2? Okay. Uh, the oceans can be both a source and a sink. So it's a little bit of a difficulty in um, modeling or understanding it. And, um, but we understand what the conditions are that dictate whether they're a net source or a net sink. In terms of the natural cycle, they're a net sink, maybe over a slow time, but then they represent a net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. And it, they do it by, there's two ways in which the oceans do that. And it's illustrated in this um, figure. One is called, a, we'll start with this one, solubility pump, which is here on the right hand side. That's a simpler one to understand. Uh, CO2 basically equilibrates with um, carbon in the water. So depending on the concentration of each of those compartments, you get some, and the temperature and salinity, different physical conditions, you get solubilization of CO2 into the water. And in areas of the world that there's net sinking of water, some of that CO2 can be driven into the deep ocean where it enters deep CO2 circulation or sediments. So if it does that, then it's removed from atmospheric circulation until that bottom water resurfaces or sediments resurface to plate tectonics. So it's essentially the word sequester, is hidden, is removed from atmospheric circulation. 
The other one that's interesting, particularly for me as a biologist, is called the biological pump. The biological pump is where this carbon is removed by the sinking of organisms. So most of the productivity in the oceans is in the surface of the ocean. Most of it's eaten in the surface of the ocean. Uh, they are decomposed, but a small amount escapes decomposition. So it falls to the seafloor, some enters oceanic deep sea circulation, so it's removed for the time the circulation in the deep sea gets completed, which is a thousand years on the average, or enters again deep sea sediments where it's removed for long, longer periods of time. So to illustrate that in kind of more um, in other images, and this is gonna relate to my class I'm teaching about the impact of microbes and planetary scale. So this shows, uh, in a sense, kind of does illustrate the biological pump. There's, uh, this is off the coast of England, or the UK, and um, this kind of cloudy water, essentially is this massive blooms, millions of microorganisms um, in the water, discoloring the water. And this is a picture of them. I think if you saw the, you noticed that when I, my opening slide had a picture of these things. These are called coccolithophores, and they have these plates made of calcium carbonate. So in addition to the trapping carbon by making organic matter for their tissues, they also make their skeletons out of calcium carbonate. So it's an addition, additional one. And I put this little box here because I wasn't debating whether I would lecture on this, but um, it's, it's probably uh, too much for uh, the time that I have. But because we understand the, this uh, removal of CO2 by biological uh, mechanisms, there's still kind of hot debate in oceanography whether and maybe not just oceanography, but th this idea of geoengineering. Geoengineering means be able to modify, uh, since we already kind of didn't have some geoengineering by adding CO2 in the atmosphere, why stop there? You know, we can do some other geoengineering to mitigate that. So one idea has been to, uh, um, to, f to fertilize the oceans, particularly some oceans that are, that are iron depleted because you don't need that much iron to increase their productivity and that way increases the efficiency of the biological pump and remove them. So think about that as a, maybe as a thought-provoking question, just the idea of geoengineering. Good idea, bad idea. You know something about oceanography, is this a good idea or bad idea? Okay. I, showed, uh, I wanted to show this, this graph, um, I mean, it's a little bit of a quiz, but because we can't have a lot of interaction, maybe I'll just um, talk, talk to through it, maybe have you think about it and I'll give you the answer. The question I was going to ask is, uh, I, I told you a little bit about oceanography already, how the oceans deal with carbon and temperature. And you always see this uh, uh, patterns of the CO2 increase in the planet. And you usually just see this one from Hawaii, from Mauna Loa, where the main observatory is. So I think Abir asked about why we have this particular CISO pattern. And people responded correctly that, well, we see the CISO pattern uh, because it uh, reflects photosynthesis and respiration on an annual scale, right? So photosynthesis consumes CO2. During the, um, the, the reverse season, the material is decomposed and CO2 is released back into the atmosphere. So my question is gonna be, well, how come here American Samoa and South Pole, uh, the seesaw pattern is much reduced? Think about it. Maybe I'll get an answer from here for uh, the recital hall. Any ideas, any hypothesis? Okay, the answer that one, somebody gave me is that there's, there's life, there's less biology. Mm, not necessarily. Um, the reason is that the northern hemisphere has more land mass, so seasonality is more marked. Right? The weather variations are greater. And the southern hemisphere obviously has more ocean. And I just showed you how the oceans serve to kind of buffer changes in CO2. So the fl wide fluctuation you see in higher, in higher latitudes is reduced in the southern hemisphere. It's kind of striking because people don't they usually just see one. So I thought it was interesting to show you this one. For our interest in the human influence, I would note that regardless of where you are on the planet, the, the um, slope is the same. So even though there's seasonal variations, um, the increase is, is constant. Okay. okay. So let's move to the, the second uh, kind of um, category of what I was gonna present. So we, we learned a little bit of oceanography. So I'd like to say something about um, some of the evidence that we have to make this link. We're interested in the Anthropocene, you know, humans have an influence on climate. And uh, I wanna talk about two things. Um, first is, uh, you know, how do we know this extra CO2, the extra CO2 in the atmosphere is really anthropogenic. There's a bunch of other sources when you see the current cycles, other sources of CO2. And uh, the second one is I already told you the, that to know, to establish that climate has changed, we need to understand something about this variation. 
and we need to take into account that a bunch of other stuff controls climate. So how do we deal with that? Okay, so the first one, how we know there's extra CO2, I think the previous two presentations kind of noted a um, major piece of evidence is that if you look at emissions, this is emission data from the IPCC report, uh, the yellow here is CO2 and there's other greenhouse gases. So you can say, well, you know, we know the, that the humans have put a bunch of CO2 in the atmosphere that's easily estimated from fossil fuel um, burnings, fossil fuels are a commodity. So the number is pretty well constrained, as we say. What I want to show you is something more direct. I mean, you could always argue this is a little more circumstantial evidence. So in science, we always want to try to provide more, um, more data. I have, I have a, a colleague used to tell me that he's... Um, that a good definition of science is that the science is the painful demonstration of the obvious. So you may have something that seems like, oh, well, it makes sense, you know, more CO2, higher temperature. When well, science, we really want to painfully demonstrate that that is true and there's no other uh, possibility, or no possible explanation. So I'll give you some data regarding a really interesting uh, study that I found that um, is kind of direct evidence to indicate that the CO2 in the atmosphere is truly from fossil fuel burning. And that's based on uh, carbon stable isotopes. I don't know how many of you have chemistry, so I'm gonna try to simplify the explanation. So um, carbon comes in three forms, three flavors, you can, you can think about it, or three weights. So the most common one is C12, then there's C13, and C14, which is radioactive. Here it shows you the relative abundances in the planet. So the majority, that's why in your textbook you rarely, unless you're taking uh, chemistry, if you're taking just basic uh, biology, sometimes they don't discuss the isotopes, because 98, well, 99, almost 99% of them is C12. But there's important differences in how these isotopes are distributed in different materials. And so different materials concentrate them in different amounts. And for our, our, our discussion and, and trying to assess the human influence on the climate, the important thing to note is that fossil fuels have very unique chemical signature based on these isotopes. So what is it? Well, as you know, fossil fuels are ultimately derived from plants, from photosynthesis. Maybe they're eaten by dinosaurs and you know, they're buried. Uh, but ultimately, photosynthesis kind of is the foundation of formation of fossil fuels. And so the process of photosynthesis algae and plants prefer the C12 over the C13. So they kind of have the discrimination by a large amount, I think it's 20%. Um, so that plant material and the fossil fuel they produce is enriched in the carbon 12. So when you burn it, that carbon enrichment goes back into the atmosphere. So it kind of dilutes, if you look at the concentration pre-industrial times of the atmosphere in terms of C12 relative to C13, that ratio is changing as we're introducing more of that fossil fuel. So it's a kind of direct marker of fossil fuel carbon and its fate in the atmosphere. So the data that shows that, um, I'll show it here. Uh, this graph shows you time and the scale. The red or pink uh, line is that of just CO2 increases, the killing curve you've seen it many times. It also includes the seasonal variation, photosynthesis respiration, but the net increase. The top one shows the decrease in the ratio of C C um, C13 relative to C12. So there's more C12 reducing that ratio. And uh, the unit that, or the scale that's used to represent this change in an isotope is called a del C13. That's what del is, this little Greek symbol. So this decrease, kind of mirror image of the increase of CO2 represents the dilution of the C13 to C12 ratio because of the increase of fossil fuel burning. The person that noted is, is SUS, so they called it the SUS effect, not, not related to green eggs and ham or that other SUS. Okay, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a descendant. I didn't check that out, okay. Uh, I also found a really interesting article related to this um, because the atmospheric concentration is changing of the relative amount of C12 and C13. Other materials that use the atmospheric carbon to make tissues or skeletons also reflect those changes. So the paper I showed, uh, I read, and I'll show you the um, one graph from it, is a study of um, uh, calcareous sponges in the Caribbean. So there's some sponges that form their skeletons of calcium carbonate. So at the time when they were formed, they were basically getting 
the CO2 from the atmosphere, and their carbon reflects the composition of the time of formation. So what they did is they look at uh, several things. This is scale, here's time from 1350 to 2000. And, uh, this color-coded um, text shows you what they measured. So I'll kind of describe what it is. The, the pattern's pretty simple, that everything agrees, so it's, it's not a complicated figure. All the things they measure agree. So what they were measuring is um, atmospheric CO2, so CO2 in the atmosphere, either direct measurements or through um, gas bubbles. And they looked at the ratio of C13 to C12 in the atmosphere, this thing that we saw declining. Oh, and by the way, to make all the lines agree, the atmospheric CO2 is as opposed to represent it as an increasing curve the way you usually see it. So it matches the declines in the other uh, curves. What they did is they reported it as the inverse CO2 concentration. So the gr a greater number when you when divide that, one divided by that gives you a lower number. So it's just a, a way to reverse the scale so you can see that everything's agreeing. So the, the increase in CO2 is uh, related to the decrease in that del C13 ratio. And the two sponges are in red and in blue. Uh, those, that's their signature in their tissues or in their sorry, in the skeleton. So also that changes. And you know, uh, for again, our interest in, um, in making this assessment that CO2 in the atmosphere is anthropogenic is after the, at the 1800s, you have this very sharp decline. The paper is interesting because it not only discusses this decline, but uh, they're actually interested in what the variations before the Industrial Revolution mean. If these sponges are actually reflecting how the concentrations are changing, it's, it's interesting to ask you know, what determined those changes in atmospheric concentrations before the Industrial Revolution. But again, for purposes, of, I think as a direct uh, evidence that um, the fossil fuel that's increasing, it's not circumstantial, but direct evidence that is due from fossil fuel burning. Okay, so how about another type of reasoning for the evidence uh, to make this assessment that humans are, are influencing climate? So I mentioned when I started the lecture that um, global climate change, um, there's a lot of components and there's a lot of variation. And we're basically relying on the connection between CO2, here's the killing curve, the most recent one I found, um, and then uh, the temperature variation. We're trying to make this connection. Right? So I'm gonna kinda tell you kind of different lines of reasoning to to make that connection. Okay, so it's mostly kind of text intensive and I'll show you some um, figures that can illustrate these points. So the first one we've seen before. So you can say, well, you know, we see temperature increasing at this, at, and we see CO, CO2 increasing, right? If you're like in a crime investigation, you could argue, well, that's just circumstantial evidence. You know, you would stand up and say, say judge, that's circumstantial, right? So what can we do to, to strengthen that that uh, statement. Well, um, you can do some predictions. So what, what scientists have done is go beyond just saying, well, it's a coincidence, but we can actually looking at the physics of uh, the effects of greenhouse gases and understanding of climate, we can make some predictions of how much the amount that's in the atmosphere, how much warming would that lead to? And then see if those estimates match the observations. The next, the next level, and that relates more to understanding how other components can be dismissed or can be um, uh, uh, not considered, uh, sorry, con consider in terms of being able to make the assessment that humans influence the climate. So the other thing we can say is that, okay, we, we understand all the different things. By understanding the climate system, we know everything that affects temperature. And we, if we can assign how much of the variation each of those components explain, if there's a component that we cannot explain, but it can be explained by human activities, that, that gives us more confidence that it is the human influence that, that uh, has caused that increase, okay? So again, different lines of reasoning. Um, you can argue that it's kind of increasing strength of the evidence when circumstantial, there's some ones are associated with um, being able to predict an outcome. And the other one is to understand all the, all the variation and explain all the different elements that contribute to that variation. Okay. So let's look at some images that support this. The first one is, it was a, the, I, the IPCC report has it. This is a really summarized, simplified one. I decided to choose this one because it would have taken a long time to explain the other one. So you wanna get more of the details of this particular figure, you can go to the IPCC report 
But what this one, this figure tries to uh, show is when we, when we calculate the total, uh, we, when we calculate the amount of warming that has occurred over a certain period of time, and then we also compute how much could be explained by our understanding of the physical effects of greenhouse gases, can we explain all that warming by it? And then we also include things that we know that are natural, such as the changes in solar output. There's been some, some changes due to um, um, solar storms, et cetera, and I think Zita is gonna talk about that as well. So this kind of summarizes that, so I'll, I'll take you through it. It, um, it shows positive or negative effects, this line of zero, so it indicates the different bars are different things that, that drive climate, with the exception of the top bar, which is the observed climate increase. Um, the, the little whiskers, they're called actually whiskers, and the data indicate the range. So there's a range of values that are associated with each of the bars. And what it's trying to do is saying, okay, we have this observed warming, and this is the range of the warming that's observed. Then we, we know from the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere and understanding on, on the chemistry of them and the physics of climate, how much should they be contributing to the warming? So this is this, and you see there's a more of a range because there's some variation. There's also some other uh, gases that um, have a cooling effect. So if, if things are on the left side of this line, they have a cooling effect. Aerosols, for example, have a cooling effect. Smog, which kind of pollutant, actually has a positive effect for, for humans in the sense that it um, so has a cooling effect in the atmosphere. And what they've done up here is they said, okay, we'll look at the, cool, the warming effects of greenhouse gases and the cooling effects of other gases and other aerosols, combine them to uh, determine how much of the increase we can predict just on the base of those factors. And you can see the prediction is pretty good. There's, in fact, a combined anthropogenic forces would show a little bit more warming than we actually observe. And if you read the recent literature, this explains something proposed to that. The oceans, again, are a way where the, where the heat is going. So this kind of more um, deal with the surface. And natural forcings, and it doesn't tell you what they all are, but it's mainly uh, the sun, solar variation, contributes very little to, um, to the warming we observe. Natural internal variability, that's kind of what I'm gonna explain next. Basically variability that um, is, uh, is known as part of the inter interannual variation of climate. Okay. So let's move into that. So the question is, climate change is not just seasonally, but over periods of decades or hundreds of years as part of a natural cycle. The best known phenomenon that has an interannual variation is El Nino. So I mentioned it because we're, this, uh, this year is supposed to be an El Nino year. So let me explain what it is in more detail and explain you the connection to global climate change. Um, okay, so pretty much El Nino, you think of this big disturbance of climate. So in the El Nino year, things are very different. And now we think of something called La Nina. La Nina is the reverse of El Nino. So El Nino can be characterized by warming in the equatorial Pacific. So here's an image shows the, the equatorial Pacific. The normal condition, the trade winds, push water towards the um, west, the water gets warm as it travels, so you get warm weather here in Indonesia, Australia. So during El Nino, the, the pressure patterns change, and essentially you can most imagine the wall, hot water sloshing back into the um, eastern uh, uh, region of the equatorial Pacific. So the whole area of the equatorial Pacific gets warmer. So here's a kind of fancy kind of cross section showing a kind of normal condition and El Nino condition. So it's easy to, to identify this signal of heat, but it's an important one because it has planetary consequences. Changes that occur in the equatorial Pacific have consequences in higher latitudes. So how do we deal with, with that and with other things? So I'll mention other things that are natural drivers of climate that are, that are important are, for example, volcanoes. When you have a volcanic eruption, it ejects a huge amount of uh, particles in the atmosphere and those have a cooling effect. There's something locally we have here, it's called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So in the Pacific, there's variations of temperature in a kind of 10 year decadal period. And they're part of kind of natural cycle variability. So how do we sort those two things out when we're really interested in this human signal? Okay. So one way to do it is to simply consider them in the analyses. So this is an example of that. Here we have, on this figure, we have um, 1950 to 2010. And this is again uh, an um, example of a temperature variation. That's again reflected as anomalies. This one doesn't tell you the anomalies relative to what. They should always tell you what 
the pattern won't change, but the, where they put the zero line will vary because the zero represents what they define as being the, the, uh, the normal or the reference condition. Okay, so we see, you know, obviously the general pattern of increasing, but there's a lot of variation in it, right? This goes up and down, up and down. You look at the trend over time, there's a, the slope is positive, there's an increase. Below it, uh, there is um, data associated with the warming and cooling effects of El Nino and La Nina. Again, major disturbances have a known intraannual periodicity, and they're episodic. So I, I bolded two areas where, sorry, bolded, I circled two areas where the impact is very noticeable. So the 1998 El Nino was one of the strongest ones on record. And you can see, is this reflected as a bigger increase in the global mean? And 2011 was, had a strong La Nina, a very strong cooling effect. So you can see a little dip in the increase. So people can argue back and forth whether this explains the um, kind of, when people talk about this, uh, uh, this is slow down on the heating. Now the most recent thing indicates that it's just an artifact of the data. But what I want to highlight this here is that some of these variations, of course, they contribute to climate variability. Here we have volcanoes, they have little pictures of volcanoes here. And you can see after the volcanic eruption, there's a little dip. So as you predict, there's a little delay, and then there's a dip in the climate. But these events are kind of episodic, and they're easily filtered out because they're very local. So mathematically, and I didn't show that because there's a lot of data, you can easily filter the signal of El Niño, La Niña, or volcanic eruptions to isolate the, the net, net increase globally. Also, because they're episodic, they don't really affect the global um, average, right? Because they're just occurring at the different points in time, even though for each individual year, they might appear as a big signal. When you average the increase over many years, um, that increase is, um, is clear. Right. Great. Okay, so let me move kind of to the last part of um, the presentation is, can we, we can establish something, hopefully you learned something about oceanography, the importance are very important. Something about the logic scientists used to support um, their understanding of the role of, of, of humans and climate. So, so what are some of the impacts on the oceans? So I, I kind of told you about the oceans having a high capacity. Well, a lot of the heat, extra heat that's going to the atmosphere to do greenhouse gases, most of it is going to the oceans. So this kind of shows you that 93.4% is going to the ocean, has a high heat capacity. So it's stored in the oceans. There's a little delay in how it's like, you know, heating, a, you know, camping, you wanna heat some water. It takes a while to heat it, right? So there's a little delay in which that occurs, which can explain some other variations that we see. The atmosphere uh, doesn't hold heat that well, so not that much heat goes into there, although it's we experience this as weather, so that's why it's important there. Uh, so anyway, you see that. The ocean side is the more, more important one. Okay, so, um, Oh, and that's increasing over time. So I just want to show you this graph. The, the, the amount is great, but the, the, the increase over time is also increasing. This one is a nice plot because it highlights that uh, our confidence in, in the numbers and their trend is increasing with the more data that we have and more instrumental data as opposed to proxy data using other ways to estimate uh, ancient or paleo temperatures. So our confidence has increased that this trend of temperature increase is real both in the atmosphere and the oceans. Okay, so, so what are the results of that? Um, I was talking to um, Abir when I was preparing my lecture, and he said, well, you better talk something about Patricia. You know, it's such a big thing. Everybody's sitting in the news, right? Patricia's a big hurricane. So I thought about it. I said, well, sure, you know, I'll, I'll um, see what I can say about it. So, so I, you know, I just went to some website, and you know, so a bunch of stuff, because it was kind of, you know, people talked about it, a lot of things. It wasn't, thankfully, it wasn't as damaging as one would expect, but certainly the strongest one on record. It intensified the quickest that's been recorded. So the question is, well, is this, is this example of extreme weather or is it an example of evidence for a new climate? You know, how, how, how do we deal with that? And those are an immediate question that people think about. So um, I'll, I'll tell you what I found summarized here in this next slide. So it's a question people have asked for a long time. Okay? Theoretically, it makes sense, right? Theoretically, the oceans have a lot of, hold a lot of energy. That energy is released into the atmosphere through evaporation so increases the potential for storminess, more energy and higher precip precipitation. But again, as scientists, you know, we're involved with a kind of painful demonstration of the obvious. So there's a lot of things that need to be done to really make that assessment. And at this point, at least all the articles I read, you know, they're still kind of debated. 
there's a lot of variation uh, in the connection between uh, global warming as opposed to local warming and more intensity. There's regional variations. It's hard to, there's many ways to quantify uh, storminess depending on which one you use. The evidence, the data may, sorry, the conclusion may be different. And also uh, the length of the time needed to make good uh, analyses considering natural variation uh, is not there yet. More data needs to be done. It needs to be acquired. However, uh, most of the models do agree with the prediction there's more energy in the system. It's bound to be more energy for storms and definitely the warmer the climate, the more moisture in the atmosphere. So there should be more precipitation. Uh, an obvious effect on climate really, uh, so I wanna highlight this one is sea level rise. And I think it was mentioned by other speakers as well. I got this from NASA, kind of the latest satellite um, estimates of how much June 2015 is a light at last update. 65.91 millimeters are converted here to metric units. Um, different ways to measure it through satellite, just altimetry, or there's a lot of uh, tidal gauges that used to measure tides, but also you could look at uh, elevation. And they're not necessarily in agreement because the ground data, as I showed here, um, varies because the shape of the continents uh, change uh, and other things affect that measurement, whereas the satellite just looks at one, one um, uh, the elevation from space, to space, I would say. So I looked a little more carefully and I found this also this nice NASA uh, visualization. I, I think I chose it because of the colors and <laughs> then silly if it shows uh, more what I wanted to say. Uh, the main point of showing this is that sea level rises doesn't affect all regions equally. Um, you might, uh, I was kind of perplexing here. Uh, they have some places in the Pacific Northwest with the sea level rise. Uh, sea level has actually decreased, not increased. But you look at the data more carefully, it's just during this period of time. So it just highlights there's a lot of fluctuations. There's variability over time and over variability over space. Why is variability over space? You know, global warming is uneven because of current circulation. Um, that's gonna be uneven. Currents change and that changes the elevation of the water masses, melting which shapes the sea level. It's a bunch of them. But one thing I wanted to mention, um, that's obvious from this diagram or this uh, map is that nations we affected differently. So maybe a little connection to Karen's talk about the importance of considering um, environmental justice in really assessing how well humans are able to respond to this problem. So we, people are affected differently and there's different perceptions of the risk and the cost of how uh, climate change is gonna affect specific regions, specific populations. Okay, so uh, the, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is, um, uh, and this is related, I, I gave you guys this reading, Donne et al. Um, and I apologize for kind of lateness of uh, submitting them. I, I wasn't sure what, what kind of focus I was gonna have in my presentation, but the, maybe at this point I'll say something about the two readings. One's the IPCC uh, report, there's a synthesis for policymakers. And I, I think that's a really interesting thing to read because in sense that you are policymakers, as citizens, kind of democracy. So uh, when I read it, I think of two things. One is basically, yeah, the, the summary that the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Global Change, summarizes as being important things in terms of climate research. And the other thing that's also interesting to discuss is um, the language that is used. Is it convincing? I was fascinated by this, how science gets communicated. So as you read it, it's a thinking a point of, of how to think about their reading, besides just the content in terms of the reports, and it, it so points out the evidence for all, a bunch of statements that you can follow to look at the actual evidence within other parts of the report. Uh, the, this other reading um, highlights kind of the impacts on biology, on ecosystems. So as an ecologist, I was really drawn to this one. So it's, it was a reading you had to do. So I'm just gonna highlight some, some of the points here um, and uh, hopefully you'll get a lot from, from reading the details. So some of the climate change impacts, we talked about sea level rise, increased stratification. Stratification means layering of the oceans because of differences in temperature. And that affects ver uh, 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 vertical mixing. And when you affect mi vertical mixing, a lot of things can happen. The bottom waters can become stagnant and you can get low oxygen. Um, as a 
we will hear in a lecture later on, ocean acidification can be a problem. So the habitat is being affected, the habitat being the space where organisms live. Uh, areas that are particularly sensitive, the poles because recession of the ice. The tropics, tropics don't experience, have evolved for millions of years, not experienced severe fluctuations in climate. So over a short time scale, that might be uh, um, very disruptive. Uh, well in ecosystems are where those, the productivity of those systems relies on water from the deep that's rich in nutrients coming to the surface where there's light. So stratification changes in circulation can um, restrict that exchange. Other things that are important is to, con to consider that humans not just have a CO2 as, as a pro environmental problem that they're, that they're, they're causing, but there's a bunch of other stuff, habitat degradation, eutrophication, so enrichment, invasive species. So global climate change becomes an additional stressor. So in terms of management, I think it's important to understand how uh, those act together synergistically, you can say. Uh, you can think of the impacts occurring at different levels, biologically speaking. Right, so we could physiology and behavior uh, responding to this rapid change in the habitat can have effects at the population level. So migrations, mass mortalities, for example, or um, uh, extinctions. And uh, finally, um, it can cre create disturbances at that ecosystem level. So the changes are so severe at the other levels that contribute to perhaps uh, defining a new ecosystem. Okay, so I think I'm gonna summarize to allow some time for questions. So I um, have some kind of summary points here. Um, simply climate, I hope I, I can really emphasize, climate is, is determined by mean conditions. So I'll maybe expand on that a little bit. Um, that it's important to understand that there's a mean and that each mean has some variation. So a lot of debate kind of forgets that, that we need to really account for variation and I hope some of the evidence I showed you indicate how that is done. Uh, Oceans and marine life are, are important, are major components of the climate system. So um, take my class. <laughs> it's a little advertising, no, for the summer or something. Now learn about oceanography, learn about everything you can. It's a really important problem and uh, interdisciplinary understanding is essential. Uh, the next bullet point is basically from the IPC report. So is that example of how scientists um, kind of, sometimes the scientific understanding of certainties is expressed uh, probabilistically but uh, when it's communicated, it's hard to do that. Uh, most people have, don't have statistics. So it's curious how they, what kind of language is used to uh, express the certainty. So this is basically from the IPC report. Increased global warming is unequivocal and human influence on climate is clear. So that's something that's translated from this huge body of technical evidence. And finally, um, global warming has major impacts on marine environments and life and a connection to more kind of the human concern about how to frame the problem, how to conceptualize the solution is that the impacts will, will vary uh, greatly regionally. So the thinking that uh, we need to kind of rethink how um, we value uh, certain solutions and how, are, how much we are willing to, um, to sacrifice uh, relates to this. And then finally, I'll uh, remind you that uh, uh, there's a continuation to this talk in a sense, I think, of. Um, Pauline's gonna talk about the other CO2 problem, which is related to ocean acidification. Okay, so th thank you, and I'll uh, take any questions. <laughs>